All right, guys, we're starting the last talk of the day. If you guys could settle down, it'd be great. All right, um, this is the last talk of the day. Uh, thanks for sticking around, for those who have stuck around. Um, so this is a talk from Anand and Gilbert. Both of those guys are engineers at Mesosphere and Apache Mesos committers. So they're gonna talk about some of the new stuff that happened in Mesos in the recent releases. Hey, everyone. So uh, this is Anand. Anand is the uh, maintainer in uh, HTTP API and, and the default executor and many other stuff in Mesos. So I'm currently maintaining the containerization in Mesos. And today we're gonna talk about the uh, Mesos containerization and the default executor. So the first question I would like to ask you guys, it is uh, what is a container Anyone want to answer that? Okay, so, so there were many people who asked me the same questions. So previously, I would just answer, uh, a container is easy, and basically it is a namespace plus C group, and when people hear my answer, they always say, oh, okay but they still look confusing. So, so, and now I convert the, the question. So when people ask what is a container, basically they want to understand why do we need container. So container, we use it for operation. So basically we have the developer to create the container image we, and we have the operator to consume the container image to create the isolation execution environment. So that's the reason people would like to use container. And for the container, containerization of Mesos, it has been there for years, since 2011. So I will briefly introduce the history of the containerization of Mesos. So uh, in 2011, we, have, we don't have a containerizer yet. And at that time, each container it's a process of Mesos. And then in that process, we have the executor which launch the task inside of each the container. And we don't have resource, any resource isolation at that time yet. And in 2012, we evolved the containerization uh, in Mesos, but we still don't have the containerizer. And we just basically Introduce the SQL and memory isolation to the to the process so that we can control some limit limited uh, amount of the resources uh, rely on the C group. And in 2014, we introduced the architecture of the Mesos Containerizer. So we have the launcher. Launcher gonna is the one who control the process to which responsible to launch the process, monitor the pit, and then uh, queue each of those processes. And we have the isolator. Isolator basically it is a life cycle hook which can prepare the environment, prepare all the things the container need before the container was launched. And we also have different isolator to achieve different isolation. So at that time, we have CPU and memory isolator. So in 2014, so it is the summer of the 2014, we introduced the containerizer and depends on the basic support of the container, we have the Mesos containerizer. And on top of that, we introduced another containerizer called Docker containerizer. It is basically used the uh, Docker command line to rely on the Docker daemon to launch Docker containers. So people might ask, uh, why, why don't we use run C at that time? Because there's no run C yet. So we just use Docker command line. Uh, and in 2016, we, it's a big change. 
for the unified continuizer. And right now, we call it universal container runtime in DCOS. So basically, we uh, a container is just the Linux feature to use to leverage the C group and namespace. So why do we why do we still rely on Docker daemon? So and then at that time, people realized like in production there are some stability issue with the Docker daemon. So we decided like, why don't we do the container by our own or Mesos containerizer? So we decided to support Docker image with our own isolation. So we introduced a uh, the Linux file system isolator, the Docker runtime isolator, and the provisioner to support the Docker image. So uh, basically, it's super easy. Just give an image name to Mesos, and Mesos is going to download the Docker image from any registry you specify. And then Mesos is going to launch that Docker image as a Mesos container. So this is what we call unified containerizer, or the UCR. So um, right now, we support a Docker image, but in, uh, it's not only for Docker image. We also support uh, some other type of the image format, like the FC image proposed by the CoreOS and the OCI image spec, which is going to land in Mesos soon. So we start to think about the question, like, uh, if we have everything rely on Docker, and we cannot guarantee semantics will never change. And sometimes semantic change will, will have some backward compatibility issue. So in the industry, we definitely need to embrace some standard. So for example, for container runtime, for image, for the container image, we, we need the container image standard. And for networking and storage, we need the corresponding standard for all the industry. So that's the reason we decide to support different spec in container during the container runtime. And as you guys can see, so for the container image, we have a Previously, people have to use Docker daemon, but right now, many other uh, container orchestrators, including Mesos and some others, they have their own container runtime, and which is just leverage the Linux kernel features. And for networking solution, previously, people rely on the lead network to support the Docker container networking with the uh, container network module. And for storage, people have to use the DVDI to use the Docker volume API to support external storage. And it seems, it seems not ideal to us because we might want to do more. And so it is for because we want the interface to be stable and we want all those no matter networking, storage, or the container runtime, they, they're all backward compatible. And we want different plugin for no matter storage or the networking. So we want different vendors, they're gonna develop their own plugin to, to, to support their own infrastructure with the, uh, with the container orchestrator. So this, these are all the reasons we need a standard. So uh, for image, People would say like, oh, I might not rely on the registry, the Docker image registry, because I might have thousands of machines. I don't want all each of machine download the image from one registry at the same time. And then the network, the networking gonna be the bottleneck. So it, it might hit some issue. And I want some other spec to do the image pooling. And then I want to define my in image runtime. So and so that's all the reason people would need an uh, image spec. And it's similar. People would, uh, are expecting a, a sp specific industry-used networking spec or storage spec. And I will introduce in the following couple slides. So for the image spec, people would like to understand like how to package application bits into an image how to package application config into image. 
So they want to understand like what's the correct way to define the image. And in the future, when they change the semantics, is this still backward compatible? So those are all the user concern. And, and then, uh, including some other big company like Google and CoS and including the Red Hat, they, they did have the concern about like, uh, will Docker change the image spec in the future? So if will it break my environment? So those are all the concern, including Microsoft, I believe. So, and then this big company get together, they figure out like, oh, maybe we should fire out a new image spec for the industry. And this is the OCI, why we have the OCI right now. And I can see might be uh, possibly in, on one day, OCI can be super popular because all the major container orchestrator all the, and the big company focus on the OCI and get rid of the uh, Docker image spec. It might be possible. So because of this concern, we decide we should support OCI in Mesos and make it compatible with Docker image together. And that's what's going to happen by the end of this year. Uh, and for the networking, similarly, we have different uh, scenario. We have similar scenario as the image as the as the container spec. So, purely in Docker, the network interface is kind of complicated because it was done together with the container runtime. But basically, when we define the container runtime, we want the network uh, specification to be stand alone. So we want to, we want, we are expecting, user might expecting like, I just want to define my network for one container or a group of container. And I don't want it to integrate with any of the runtime. I just want to like, I define the container network. The container have the option to join this network or not. And this is the reason like, the, no matter Mesos or Kubernetes or invest made the decision to use the CNI. Because the CNI is a very clear networking interface. Basically, it only has two operations for the container network, attach and detach. Just attach the network to the container and detach it after you use it. And, so, and then for different uh, network solutions, the networking vendor is going to develop their own plugin to provide different uh, usage for the container network. So it makes the container network definition super easy and super clear. And as I mentioned, this is the add and delete. It is the attach and detach of the container network. Uh, so if people have some spe special uh, architecture or special networking hardware, they can basically, they can just develop using the API, develop their own network plugin using the CNI network plugin to integrate with their container. And the CNI, the CNI isolated on Mesos just do one thing, which is super simple. Just clone the network namespace for the container and that's it. So what, uh, whatever the, the rest should be done by the CNI plugin. So it's a clear uh, architecture and make it pluggable so user can define any of the plugin by themselves. And the plugin is super easy to write, like in two hours. Uh, similar to the storage, in this, I think there's a talk this morning at 11.50. So G introduced the CSI as the latest storage specification. So I will not cover the CSI detail here. So basically, it's similar to the networking. Just create the volume, delay the volume, attach and detach, and mount and unmount for the volume. So people, can, uh, you guys can can take a look at uh, G's talk this morning. I guess we have the recording to get more information about the CSI. Uh, so, and then I'm gonna just briefly introduce two latest feature on the Mesos continuization. So the first one is the nested container. So uh, 
I'm super happy to talk to a couple of folks from Uber and from uh, Verizon. They are already using the nested container for production. And for the nested container, basically we decide to support nested container in September last year. So we want to, the, the, the motivation, there are mo many motivations, but basically we want uh, a group of container can be managed in the same life cycle so that to support any specific application, let's say I have uh, my main application running in the, my main container, but meanwhile, I am expecting like I have some sidecar container to do the backup or to do the logging and many other functionality. So this group of container, they should have the same life cycle and some of them die, means the whole the container should be cleaned up. So uh, depends on this motivation, we investigate into it and we realize like, oh, we can introduce a hierarchy for containers. A container can be nested inside of another container and then we can have even couple level of nesting. So in Mesos nested container, we support up to 32 level nested container. It is limited by the namespace. For example, it's limited by the pit namespace because in kernel level, the pit namespace was implemented in a hierarchy way. So it is up limited up to 32 level. And right now we ha already have some container running in the third level nesting, so which is we, we already running in our environment. And in nested container, we support many features. For example, we support a, a volume sharing. People, user can define a volume and it can be shared by a couple containers uh, from the sibling, no matter the container is your sibling or the container is your ch child container. So they can all always share the same volume. And we also support sharing uh, other, some other resources. For example, recently we support pit namespace sharing. So a container depends on the configuration we define for Mesos in the framework, from the framework put above. We can have a container share a pit namespace with the other. The container have the option to share or not. Uh, so, uh, yeah, basically, this is the just a simple work path how we launch a nested container. So, we rely on the executor, which is the default executor, and I'm gonna introduce next. So, the executor gonna talk to the agent to launch a nested container, which is, is inside of the executor container. And, and then we have a clear pull above to allow user to do all those nesting container things. So user does not need to do too much, just define your pull above from the framework. And depends on the nested container, we recently we developed the, implement the debug container. So as you guys can see, this is the top level container and we have the executor running inside of a container and then we launch an Nginx nested container inside of it. And, and then we realized like, oh, I want to enter the Nginx container's namespace and debug, in, debug the Nginx in case the user specifies something wrong, some wrong configuration for the Nginx. So I want to shell in or bash in to the Nginx so, and then I can just create a debug container by the operator so operator will just say, oh, could you launch an, a debug container for me? And then I can just shout in and then to do whatever I want. It's similar to the Docker exec and attach. So just debug any container you want in, it, in the container's namespaces. Uh, so yeah, that's the brief int introduction to the Mesos containerization. And then I think we want Anand to introduce the default executor for us. So, so yeah, hello everyone, and I know this is the last talk, so just appear with me for like a 20 more minutes. Uh, can you switch this off? Okay. Okay, so yeah, so in this section of the talk, we would be mostly focused on the executor, the executor API, and more specifically, the default executor, which is a new executor that we introduced in 
a MIF of 1.1 that allows you to launch the task in a nested a container. And by introducing this default executor, the lines between a custom executor and like, like the line between implementing your own custom executor and just using the default executor for most use cases have now bridged. So I guess one motivation for this talk is that once you go over all the features of the default executor, it should be possible for you to deprecate all custom executors that have like overlapping functionality with the a default executor. So I guess let's start with the most obvious a question, what exactly is an executor? So an, an executor is, a, is a, a process that is launched by the emissive agent to execute your task. Now an executor can handle one or more than one task, meaning there is a one is to end mapping between an executor and a, a task. So, there are a couple of ways about how you can go about implementing your own executor. You can either use the old API, which is non-standard, and it was also based on a lib process on message passing, or you can use the new V1 API, which, which is also based on HTTP, and is based upon using a JSON or a protobuf. And the nice advantage of this new API is that there is no a native a dependency, so now you can actually implement your executor in any language of your choice, provided the language actually has HTTP abstractions, meaning they allow you to use a simple HTTP client. And I guess the uh, uh, recommendation from us for now is to exclusively use the V1 API because we would be uh, deprecating the old API soon. So what are the types of executors we support? So uh, currently, there are four types of executors that are supported. So the first, and I would call it the oldest one, is the a command executor. So every time you launch a simple a command-based task, let's say you launch a sleep task with a marathon, so, so, when, so under the hood, the agent would actually launch something called a, a command executor, which would actually execute your task. The command executor is based on the old API, and it only supports a launching one task. So every time you have to launch a new task, a new a command executor would actually be spawned by the emissive agent. Uh, recently, we also introduced a agent flag called the HTTP command executor that allows you to use the old command executor with the new API. The advantage of using this flag is that in the old API, it was a bidirectional, meaning the agent used to establish a, a connection with the executor, and the executor used to establish a, a, a connection with the agent. So when using the new API, it's just one directional, meaning the executor is the one that establishes a, a, a connection with the agent, while the agent doesn't establish a connection back with the executor. So I have found that it was useful for some a, a use cases when a pupil did not want to open any ports for the agent to the executor a communication. The other executor that we support is the a Docker executor, and it is again based on the old API, and it allows you to launch a one of a Docker containers. The, the third executor is the a custom executor, which is not a built-in executor. Anyone can implement an executor based on their a business needs in either the old API or the new API, and it supports both a task and a task group. I would explain what a, a task group means in some time. And the executor that we would be focusing most in this talk is the a default executor, which is based on the new a V1 API, and it a supports a launching multiple a task group. So I guess the first immediate a question is what exactly is a, a task group, and what are the advantages of using a, a task group over just using a multiple task? So a, a task group, as by the name goes, is just a a collection of tasks with the nice invariant that all the tasks in the a task group would be delivered atomically to the executor. So it has all or nothing semantics. I would come to what that actually means. So I guess the, the first question then, as I was saying, that why should we use a task group instead of just relying on tasks, right? So I guess when when we are running most workloads in production, 
what usually happens is that we have like one main application, which is the application which has all our business logic, but we also want to run other sidecar containers or other adapter containers, meaning we also want to do a logging for our main application, and we don't want to have that a logic in the main application itself. Similarly, we don't want to have the metrics a collection logic in the main application itself, and we would like to have some kind of an adapter container. Another use case for having a task group can be that you, you might want to run something like a file sharing application, and all this a group of containers actually want to share the uh, uh, volumes with the main application. The third and the most exciting use case that that most people use a task group or a pods for are that the life cycle of all the tasks in a, a task group are aligned, meaning if one task in a task group fails, the entire a task group is killed. So I guess this explains that why would you prefer task group over task, but, but why can't you just use task with the old API itself, meaning why did we have to build a new abstraction called a, a, a task group in a Mesos. So I guess that had mostly to do with a, a limitation that we had with the scheduler and the executor API that didn't allow a, a launching a, a group of tasks atomically. So the way uh, currently the launch operation works is that a, a scheduler signals its, signals its intent to the master that it wants to launch multiple tasks through a launch operation. Now the master asks the agent to launch these tasks one by one through a separate a run task a messages. And it might be possible that an agent becomes a, a partitioned away from the master and you might a, a drop all those a run task a messages. Or there might be a use case around, a, let's say a, a scheduler a received an offer and it actually launched the main application on the agent. And by, by the time it could actually launch other sidecar containers on the same agent from other a scheduler actually uh, took all the uh, resources available on the agent. So now the a scheduler can't launch any more uh, sidecar containers without explicitly uh, reserving uh, resources. So uh, that is how, so I guess the fix that I was talking about that we had to introduce this new uh, task group abstraction in the new API that uh, provides all or uh, nothing AP, all or uh, nothing of uh, semantics that, that allow a task to be explicitly, I would say, atomically uh, delivered uh, to the executor. So that brings me to the uh, default executor and what, what a features does it have. So we introduced the default executor in a of 1.1. The, the default executor launches all the tasks in a, a task group as a nested container. So let's take an example. If your task group has a three tasks, the default executor would actually launch a three nested containers, that is one nested container per task. Okay, and as I said earlier, all the tasks in a task group actually share the same namespace, meaning they share the same network namespace and volumes. And the other thing that you need to realize is that we currently haven't built a resource isolation for a nested container for MVP. So that means that, uh, let's take an example that if your executor has a three a CPUs, and let's say you have a three tasks in your task group, and each one has one a, a, a CPU. Since there is no isolation between tasks in a, a task group, what might happen is that any task in your task group can go up to a three CPUs, and it might actually mean that the other task might starve. And uh, that is something that we want to eventually fix, but it would mean that we need to build a support for hierarchical C groups in a Mesos. Yeah, and as I alluded to earlier, that the default executor launches a, a nested container for every task in the task group. Okay, so yeah, so what are the features of the default executor that might overlap with your existing custom executor? So the first one is health checks, or I would call probes, which are like non-interpreting health checks. The second feature is authentication, and the third feature is a custom kill policies. So let's actually go over the a workflow of how the default executor communicates with the agent. I guess it's always, it's an internal implementation detail of the default executor, but it would anyways be a good to know as to what is happening behind the hood, right? So if we see, 
So what is happening is that the MIFO agent actually launched a new executor, and it, it is actually awaiting on the uh, await pit system call, right? So now, upon launch, the default executor now sends a subscribe call to the MIFO agent, and the a request is a, a post request made to the API v1 executor endpoint, and the type of the call is a subscribe, which has the executor and the framework ID associated with the executor. Upon receiving the subscribe call, the agent responds back with a subscribe event and actually opens a new a persistent a connection, meaning all a future events from the agent to the executor would actually be streamed on this a persistent a connection. So as you can see that the response is HTTP 200 OK, and, and all of these events are actually wrapped in something called a record IO format, which is just a simple format, which is event length followed by the event itself. So in the event here, if the, the type is subscribed, right? Okay, so after the agent sends the subscribed event to the executor, it then sends the launch group event. So launch group event is the actual launch operation that the scheduler initially had sent to the a master signaling its intent to launch these task groups, right? So as you can see that the a launch group actually has something called a task group inside it, which is just a collection of tasks. Now, the default executor, what it does is, for every, every task in the task group, it would now send a launch a nested container call to the agent, and now this call is made to the API v1 endpoint, which is the operator API endpoint. And the type is launch a nested container, and it just has a, a simple command called sleep. Okay? Now, after actually ensuring that the container is launched, the second step that the default executor does is, invoke the wait a nested container call to the MSO agent. So the way I interpret the wait nested container call, it's similar to the wait or the wait pit system call in a Linux in that it's a, it's a, a blocking call, meaning the call would only receive a, receive a response after the nested container has terminated either successfully or with a, or with a, a failure. And the response would also contain the a container status as to why the a container actually are terminated. And uh, usually the default executor sends that back to the a scheduler via a task status update so that the scheduler is also able to know as to what happened with the task, right? So in this example, uh, let's say the a default executor had a, a task group which had task one and task two, and it actually sends a wait nested container call for every task in the a task group. So there would be a two wait nested container calls. Okay, so now let's move on to the a task group a life cycle with respect to the default executor. I guess what it means is that what if the default a termination a policy which is used by the default executor when a task in a, a task group a terminates, okay? So in this example, let's say you have two a task group, task group one and task group two, and they both have a two tasks, right? And now let's say the a task two in task group one exited with one, status code one. So now, uh, what happens? So the invariant used by the default executor in the default termination policy is that if any task in a task group fails, it would actually kill the entire uh, task group. So what would happen is that it would go ahead and then also kill the task one, okay? Okay, so in a, a similar way, Another invariant that is used by the default, default termination policy is that if any task in a task group exits successfully, that means that the rest of the task in the task group are not impacted. So in this example, let's say the task two exits with a zero status code, the task group is still alive, meaning nothing happens with the task group, okay? Now, let's say the task one also died with exit code zero, it can very well had been an exit code one, meaning it actually failed. Now what happens is that the default executor commits a suicide. So the invariant now is that the default executor would commit suicide if it has no more active task group, okay? So I guess what does this default termination policy means for us? So if you have a requirement around running a sidecar containers, the a recommendation is to put them in a separate a task group because you don't want your entire main application to die just because your a, a logging sidecar container failed, right? 
In some use cases, you might, but in most use cases, you don't. So the our recommendation actually is to put them in a separate task group. And as I said earlier, that as long as you specify the same executor ID when you are doing a launch operation, the agent would ensure that it is delivered to the correct default executor instance. All right? So yeah, so now let's go over all the features that we introduced in the default executor one by one. So the first feature is health checks. So currently we allow you to enter the health check a protocol inside a task info. And we currently support a three types of health checks, HTTP, a TCP, and a command health checks. And again, the, the a default behavior is that if the health checks fail, meaning if the number of failures are more than the max of failures, the default executor would kill that nested container. And then the a default a termination policy that I was showing you in the last a couple of slides would kick in. Okay, so yeah, so going ahead, all built-in executors rely on the a checker a native library. All custom executors are also encouraged to use it. And the interesting bit here is that the command health checks are actually implemented using a debug nested containers. So every time you the executor makes a command health check, it actually spawns a new default new a debug container, which is nested inside the main container, because the command health check needs to be executed from the same mount, mount namespace as the parent container. And we don't have these IDO synchronicities for the HTTP and TCP health checks, because the nested containers are all in the same network namespace, but it's just that the command health checks are a bit harder to implement. Okay, so I guess a probe for non-interpreting health checks are pretty similar. The only difference between a normal health check and a probe is that they are not interpreted by the executor, meaning if even if they fail, they are just forwarded to the scheduler. Okay. The second feature that we actually support is executor authentication. We actually introduced this feature in a message 1.3. So it's mostly a security feature in which we don't allow a, a malicious executor a process to actually a mimic a real executor and then do something bad on your a cluster. So it's, it just prevents executor impersonation. And yeah, so as I said earlier that in this particular example, you have a, a malicious a, a process that might want to subscribe with the a message agent using the same framework ID and the executor ID and executor authentication prevents that. So coming on to the last segment, we do have some things on the immediate roadmap that we would like to fix. The first one is having support for a custom termination policy. As I alluded to earlier, that the default executor has this default termination policy, and some user or some use cases would be to actually go around that, meaning instead of killing the entire task group, you might want to restart a task or have some other business logic. So introducing a custom termination policy would allow you to do that. The other bit that we are interested in is having a support for a resource isolation for nested containers and also executor authentication. We also want to build a support for a custom a secret a generators. Currently, we only support a, a JWT a token, which we might want to change the implementation. And yeah, as I said earlier, all contributions are welcome. If you see an item that is not in the, in the immediate roadmap that you want to be included, just a chat with me or a Vinod. Yeah, so in summary, the missiles a containerization Containerization has been stable and in production for a, a lot of years. It, it makes you immune to all the bugs in the a Docker, a, a Docker daemon. It's a pluggable and extensible, and we always try to embrace the new a container standards. And for the second part, I try to use the a default executor as often as you can because it's well maintained and owned by the community. And there are some overlapping use cases with the custom executor that you might want to uh, deprecate your custom executor. Yeah, so that's about it. And uh, thanks a lot for attending the talk. Appreciate it. Any questions? <laughs> Just a uh, point of clarification. Who, what is responsible for isolation? Is it the agent or is it the executor? So do you want me to answer it or do you want? Uh, I, I think I can, I can answer this. So I, 
So the any of the isolator depends on the right now depends on the isolator interface. So the isolator can prepare for whatever the container need before the container launch, and after the container was launched, and the isolator can update the resources during the container is running. So this is useful for useful for the like the persistent volume for these resources, like the memory for memory changes and the CPU resources, they are all rely on different isolator. And also it can uh, it can also do some isolation, some particular isolation during the uh, during the container update after that uh, container update the resources, but it wants some extra logic to isolate the environment for the container. So basically for most of the feature, no matter the networking storage, Files, file, syst file system isolation, this coder, they can all achieve by an isolator. An isolator module is the most co one of the most common way people do customization with Mesos. And to answer you in one line, it's the isolator modules that are actually loaded by the agent that actually does the isolation and are not the executor. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Thanks, guys.